Hello, my name is uh, Kazi Shurti Azim. I am a full time first year student at the BMI program. I am a Fulbright scholar from Pakistan. This is my fourth month in the US. Uh, back, uh, before coming to BMI, I was a faculty for communication design at the university. A graphic designer, I was also director for community services at the Rotary Club and a numerologist. <coughs> I was also South Asia's first and only uh, self-advocate for the autism spectrum for the entire region, that's India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. <laughs> Hyperlexia, Asperger's syndrome, hyper-focused uh, pattern recognition. Uh, I also work differently. I convert visual data into knowledge by seeing patterns in large amounts of text and images. It allows me to learn differently and slightly faster about new technology and then teach it to others. This is how I grew and learned. When I came here to DMI, I started adapting and modifying myself, learning by doing and prototyping. It's almost like riding a bicycle down a mountain, but it's also rewarding. <laughs> I met very nice people here, people who inspired others at the Media Lab, at Google, at NASA. I learned about patterns and technology affecting their lives as well as mine. I saw the power of ideas and creativity. I became a volunteer at the first Boston's first TEDx Beacon Street. I met Jean Plenza, Spanish uh, sculptor. His work uses text and numbers, arranged in patterns, set against iconic landscapes. I just love the connection of patterns and you know, morphology in his work, and it inspired me. I met uh, Ray Kurzweil. <coughs> Predictions in his book, uh, The Singularity is Here, uh, Near, indicate that technology must evolve following the patterns of nature. Again, this, this really did allow me to think about patterns much more deeper than I would have thought of before. So I started changing myself. This is life imitating art. I changed my appearance to become part of the pattern to fit in the crowd. One of the first projects I did at BMI was the You Are Here project, which uh, essentially allowed me to think about connections between hand gestures, between communication and divination. The role of patterns in the mapped lines of the palm for palmistry and prediction. I started looking at the work that was done previously by other alumni and students of BMI. Uh, Elizabeth Lawrence, in her thesis in 2006, worked on tarot for mapping divination processes. Uh, now, essentially, there are, I, when I looked at her work, I, I didn't see patterns emerging very strongly since a tarot deck, which is essentially a pack of cards, it's shuffled pretty randomly. There are variable outcomes. So I th started thinking more about my own work with numerology, mapping unique date of births to divination outcomes through patterns and formula. I wanted to use numerology to advise people about life-changing decisions. That was something that I was sort of interested in back before coming here. I wanted to create a multi-sensory uh, visualization, which I have never actually done before, for numerology. The way I thought about doing this was uh, visualizing numbers, connecting and mapping numbers to sounds, to images, to animations, to visualize it. Uh, again, this was something new to me and I was really interested in this. So a sort of an experience that I created was something like this. A user would use these radio frequency RFID enabled cards to input their date of birth instead of saying it. Another project I did at Design Studio was a reinterpretation of the uh, short film by Jorgen Lett, Perfect Human. I started thinking about deconstructing it, about the narrative. I wanted to make it interactive. The, the short film refers to a so-called perfect human with stereotypical activity, the man is smoking, the woman is making her hair. I wanted to make uh, it updated to today's time, make it relevant. I started thinking about uh, perhaps converting it into an interactive game, uh, making it more immersive, more uh, engaging. However, there were some limitations, especially in terms of its application. I started thinking a bit deeper about this, about how would it affect and become for 2012 perhaps, for the time it was now. So 
The world right now has moved from post-colonial to a post-industrial process. It's post-democratic. It's a form of corporate autocracy. This is what the economist Jeffrey Sachs refers to in his book, uh, The Price of Civilization. The world now, its economic and political system is essentially controlled by corporations or corporate interests. Where now the perfect human is essentially a perfect customer, buying and using products. I started thinking deeper about this experience. How would a user interact? Would it be procedurally by touch, by using a mouse and a keyboard, or by gestures, or sound, voice activation? I thought a bit deeper about what would be a perfect human. Would that person use the internet for products, such as shoes and coats? Would they buy things online? Would they use Google or Bing? Would they like these? Would they be social media capable? The first experience I prototyped was using the Connect and the Visual Studio. I wanted to use its uh, gestural and verbal interaction ability and link it with social media. So one of the first prototypes I created was this. the system using my hand or talking to the system by navigating different options. I divided things that we buy each day, drinks, grocery food. I said the word coffee. Like and then actually give it a like thumbs up option. Here. I should also go back. There were some limitations in terms of how I thought about this process, so I started updating it primarily for a multi user environment, perhaps online. So I thought more now about the perfect customer, social media friendly gamified version for deeper interacting, uh, engaging interaction between customers and brands beyond the scope of traditional consumer role play. I took a prototype uh, product, such as Coca-Cola Light. How would that work for, for that particular brand? I started thinking about a social media application, such as an application or a game on Facebook, <coughs> and the users could essentially uh, choose between different uh, competitions to play their, their time limited. They could get points for these, completing each one, just like you would complete levels in a game. Different activities such as watching videos or answering questions would be posted on social media. It would give you points. It would also, these points would be redeemable. You can see them right up there for different prizes and awards. You could even share your picture online with your profile photograph and get more points, tying in other social media platforms, not just Facebook. You would essentially have an interactive environment where things like the Connect could be used for games. You could play these games with your friends online challenge them. There would be a score table. You could uh, share your score online with your friends or check with other people on Facebook. And this will essentially allow people to become more engaged. So what's different between this and other platforms or other services out there? I, I thought essentially about using a Connect, a multi-user social media environment, tying in with existing media. I thought about participating content, Facebook's multi-game a user game with logos and packaging and enhanced graphics. Uh, I thought about a leaderboard or score system between users, friends, and the whole network, just to make it more engaging. So essentially for me, a perfect human would be a part of a system, be a part of a pattern, adding to the whole. Another project I did in the Elements of Media class, I wanted to create a low-cost projection system based uh, on an experience for teaching children on the autism spectrum. Uh, a test case that I took was a projection-based game uh, for children. Uh, this would essentially prolong eye contact. Children with autism, primarily, the uh, majority of them have macrocephaly, which is a slightly larger size of a brain. Uh, the amygdala is larger, which causes a problem. Prolonged eye contact is an issue. I want to use recycled products, 
like cardboard boxes in soup cans. So I took two boxes uh, and I took two empty plastic cups. I took a Pico projector. These aren't very expensive, between $150. I created an animation which could run on a projector or on a memory card. And I could then, uh, this would be a running animation of projection of eyes and these eyes would be moving. Uh, I could then, uh, the children could use their hands Add these two cups and for an example here. Now the eyes are uh, moving slowly, of course. This builds up tolerance for children to keep looking and the eyes maintaining that gaze. You could have multiple children interacting at the same time. So prolonged eye contact would then, of course, promote memory-based pattern recognition within children on the autism spectrum. So uh, this is what I want to achieve with that particular project. Another project I did for the uh, Designer Experience class was prototyping using a simple everyday object like a rope. So this is early in the semester. We created objects for picking up objects, or you know, a sticky rope to pick up fire objects, prototyping. But then I started thinking about the pattern process. I thought of the rope as a thread to create larger objects create fabrics with it. A lot of my work essentially is tied into patterns because I have done textile print and pattern before coming here. Even my graphic design work, it's based on grids and patterns, it's modular. I was able to hear J.J. Abrams at the Media Lab last month. He said that creativity is organic, it's an evolving process. So I wanted to take my interest in patterns and my design work and use that for other processes. I created some charcoal uh, drawings and sketches for the design experience class. This allowed me to think about self-analysis and why I do things and the way I do them, and essentially allowed me to grow better as a designer. One of the projects uh, we did was a uh, response to Alice Monroe's uh, short story, Fitz, and uh, so a fellow DMI student, Sky, gave me an image, that she, a photograph that she took based on her interpretation, and I developed it for this slide. <laughs> Again, this is a representation from the story. It's an animated version of that. What did I learn from this? Well, I learned that objects and artifacts can be used in dynamic and changing context, depending on perspective, culture, and problem solving. We give meaning through memory. Hence, meanings can be changed indirectly by changing memory or by creating newer memories. The MI student Fish McGill, uh, his response to the same story was creating a ladder, a wooden ladder. So I collaborated with him. I took his object that he created. Now he's an illustrator, he makes very really nice drawings. And I look at his illustrations as motifs in a pattern. So I printed them out and I stuck them to his object. Uh, and essentially changing its look and feel. So this elevates his object from a utilitarian artifact into something more of an interactive experience. You move it out, you can climb it, see his drawings better. We visited uh, Mass Boca. I saw Saul Lubitz's uh, wall drawing retrospective. Started thinking about his mathematical nature of his patterns and wall designs. I'm really inspired by patterns. The project I did early in the semester was uh, deconstructing an object, breaking into different colors, making those objects into a pattern, and using them for different uh, objects, perhaps for art. So I see my work is really being tied in with mathematics natural phenomena. I looked at uh, living system theory by James Greer Miller, an American biologist. Talks about dynamic patterns of relationships between organisms and environment. So I believe this is tied into something larger. One of the research uh, projects I did this semester was uh, the analog to digital conversion for education, particularly university education, what's happening right now with it. I'm interested in the way people learn primarily because of my background as an educator. One of the world's, uh, world's earliest uh, universities was 2,500 years ago in Pakashila, which is Taxila in modern day Pakistan. Uh, this was uh, probably one of the oldest documented universities. They had free independent education there. It was paid for by the ruler between that time. It used to take longer, you know, between 12 to 16 years of education for somebody to graduate in some modern that form. This is towards the east. In the west, one of the oldest surviving universities is the University of Oxford. About a thousand years old, 
And the system that they have, uh, they had back then, which is the college-based system, you have endowment funds, you have scholarships, enrollment processes, admission process. The, the whole system is based on tutorials. It's pretty much the same. It hasn't really changed over the last nearly 900 or 1,000 years. But I was looking at more recent examples. And these were essentially, of course, changed through technology. We had the printing press back about 500 years ago, uh, which uh, made books cheaper, accessible. We had personal computers. They've only been around for about 32 years, since the 1980s. Uh, you had the sharing of research happening back then. Uh, the internet has been around, around for 17 years, so around 95 onwards, where you had personalized live learning, interactive learning. <coughs> One of the earliest examples and the largest ones was University of Phoenix as an online example for uh, education, uh, giving degrees uh, through different processes. It's been around for, since 1976 with over 200 campuses, over 100 degree programs. However, the University of Phoenix was fined uh, many times in the last 10 years for deceptive enrollment practices. And just two months ago, they closed about 115 locations around the world. So a change is coming eventually. People are realizing that something has to be done about the credibility of online education. There were some early failures in online education, such as the Fathom system, which was you know, uh, a team effort by Columbia and the London School of Economics and British Library and New York Public Library. They spent about $25 million. They tried to charge for online course materials with no credits given or certificates. Uh, they were able to reach about 65,000 students who took over 2,000 courses in 52 countries. It was a very early effort, but I believe uh, there have been better successes, particularly in the last 10 years with open content initiatives, such as the MIT Open Courseware Project, uh, Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative, uh, the Open Yale Courses. So a lot of uh, progression is happening. People don't essentially charge just to try a different uh, education model out. You, you give your resources online. But there has been a lot of change in terms of the credibility or getting credit for these. I'm going to be talking about this in a few minutes. The experience of online education, it's slightly different from that in a class. Uh, a lot is lost in terms of your, you, know, you can't really uh, interact physically with your classmates or teacher, but you can do the same thing virtually. You can ask them questions, you can see videos at your own time, at your own leisure, your own pace. There, there are networked uh, video conferencing environments. This has, of course, uh, culminated in the last couple of years in something called MOOCs, these massive open online courses. Now, this type of online course is particularly designed for large-scale participation, open access via the web. These are a very recent development, and since uh, they, they are sort of tying in with these courses that you would take at a college or university level, but typically uh, they won't really give you credit. But a difference is coming here. A lot of companies have come in to try to give you credit for these courses. So it is sort of now possible to get college credit, and a lot of universities have signed up for that system for these moves. We have websites such as learningcounts.org where they do evaluate what you've learned, and you can pay them, you can get credit for the courses you've done. Uh, tens of thousands of people around the world could now walk away with three credits from any uh, leading university, more are signing up every day, such as the University of Maryland, uh, George Washington University, just to name a few of them. In the last, uh, two years, more than one and a half million people have signed up for these MOOCs, online courses, for uh, programs and platforms such as Coursera, edX, and Udacity. A lot of you know, leading universities uh, such as the MIT, Stanford, and Harvard are now offering their courses online with their, the complete service is essentially the same as their undergraduate and graduate program. A lot more recognition is happening for these. We're seeing a huge shift very, very soon. Uh, so what, what's going to happen now? Well, wider acceptance for these online courses and emergent online hybrid between degrees and certificates, something in the middle is now going to emerge online. We are going to see within one year a lot more undergraduate degrees for credit online, not just for a semester, which is bad ways. There's a quote by the president of Northeastern University. He's saying we're witnessing the end of higher education as we know it. He's not saying we're witnessing the end of higher education itself. It's just a different experience. The experience has changed very fast. So in summary, I see patterns all around me. I use these to predict outcomes. My design process relies on inspiration from logic and structure. Where do I see myself going? I see myself thinking more about pattern recognition, used particularly with visualization for big data and getting inference from all of that knowledge and numbers. And I see myself going very strongly in this direction. 
the best way to predict the future is to create it. It's called by Edwin Lincoln, and I hope to create the future. Yes. Thank you very much. I think the, for, well, if you're saying personally, yes. it's more about people actually using my projects. And so I haven't been able to test these out in public on a larger scale. But that's something I'm going to be interested in very soon, you know, testing when I get more time perhaps to work on these projects. I think it's the sense of wonder and a connection with how people learn. That's something that's really that fuels what I am. I am an educator. And I just like to see people grow. And the way I see people growing, is having accessible access to technology, to innovation, to these processes, which and experiences, which I can then design. So it's about how they engage and how they grow. And growth is something very important. Yeah, I would love. I would love to see because the I mean, the common like the common thread that throughout the work is, is fascinating. And you're looking at it from so many different angles, both in terms of uh, you know, the autism spectrum disorder, all the time recognition. But I would love to. Uh, and broad research that you're pulling from all these different disciplines. So I would love to start seeing a dialogue with with the with the work, and then which is you know potentially how people are experiencing it, and uh, just the more of an iterative uh, design process. Because you know, the research is is, is fabulous and deep, and you know, there's uh, many different sources. I hope this is only the beginning. <laughs> several parts to that. Part of it is this iterative process. Um, another part is the way in which you sort of reveal to us how this work uh, manifests itself. You know, so like, for example, in the numerology piece, I think there's a lot of really interesting elements in there, right? The patterns that you see, um, the way in which those numbers transform into, into those experiences. I think you want to do a better job of explaining to us how we get from point A to point B, right? So you went from a date to uh, to a sonic experience and a visual experience, which I think is a really interesting thing. Like that's a really interesting journey. You obviously have some sort of system in which this translation attack takes place. You need to reveal that to us, right? I want to see the algorithms. I want to see the rules that you've defined so that these things. How do we go from A to B? In that way, uh, that's I mean that's part of your role in terms of teaching as well. How do you crack open this this creative process and let us really get? I think that would really benefit your work because we can see that there are elements there, but we're not able to get access to them, right? That's something you need to let let, let us get more involved with. It. I wanted to make it encapsulated because a lot more people uh, aren't really interested in the mathematical aspect of it. This is sort of a, but I would, of course, do right. that. Right. And yeah, it doesn't have to be at a, at, a, at a high level of math. It's more about explaining to us how did we get how do we get from a number to a color? How do we get from a number to a sound? From there, you can start digging more deeply in terms of saying, well, if we're going to use numbers to create sound, um, what type of sound are we interested in? You know, uh, what sort of relationships? You know, what makes a good sonic experience, et cetera, et cetera? What makes a good color experience? And each of those elements, you can spend months really digging deeply into. Um, and so we don't expect you to have all of that together, but more about creating those packages, creating those wires. And by the way, they are patterns. It's, it's, it's not to, uh, to advise you to do something you you're not interested. In. It's just to create equivalence that that creates certain patterns which eventually proceed. I'd like you to to comment perhaps on you use the metaphor. And you actually often return to, to that metaphor. 
and he also overused the buzzword mathematics. Mathematics, and that's it. Could you reconcile those two different metaphors you're using? Well, if you refer to the Fibonacci series, uh, it has a lot to do with the representation of nature. Nature can be simulated, perhaps not to like 100%, but close enough, visually. And uh, mathematics is just an expression of nature itself. Whatever we are, whatever we see around us, these are mathematical patterns. You go in an aircraft, you look down, you see the surface of the land. It's completely, you can simulate these, you can recreate these with the mathematics. Uh, it's tied with biology. I don't believe science and innovation can progress very far ahead unless we start growing computers and putting them inside us. That is the future. We have to, what the people at tech call homo evolutus. We can now change the course of our evolution. We have the ability. Uh, yesterday, uh, Ray Kurzweil started working for Google. He's now their chief engineering officer. And I believe the singularity is very near. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it is. <clears throat> uh, so, that's pretty obvious that mathematics can express biology and nature. Fibonacci series, the section, and other patterns are numerology. What is the intersection of numerology with that expression of biology? I think for the last uh, 2,600 years approximately, uh, Pythagoras has been, uh, well, his work, his original work in mathematics, he was one of the world's first mathematicians. A lot of his work had to do with uh, regression and correlation and statistics and how, you know, getting a large number of sample of people is normal, estimating probability with very high accuracy to what would be common between those people. The way we think is an expression of nature itself. And because there is a system, there is a program, it's DNA, DNA is a software, nothing else. The way we think, it's all programs, uh, you know. So I believe the way we express and the way we act, there is a system in place. My initial research, which I didn't talk about, which I presented sort of mid-semester, had a lot to do with how the human mind is connected to a, um, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, this is because of uh, this magnetite, a biogenic material in the human brain. Uh, th there is evidence for it, uh, and it's there in all animals. That's how they navigate the Earth using uh, geolocation, GPS, sort of, you know, school platform. Uh, and we have it too, but no one's really been talking about it. And yes. So now you have this reference of mega patterns. Yeah. And then there's a pattern of interaction with the product you're making or with the interface which takes the date of birth into and translates it into experience of sonic and visual nature. Can you connect them? I mean, don't, don't answer me this question. Yeah. Could you put on your radar this very challenging task of trying to connect the different scale of those patterns, and perhaps using certain experiences you already accumulated through your research to more practical, immediate solutions and patterns of interaction and user experience with whatever you, you build? That would be advice, if you could, <laughs> put it on your plate for next semester, trying to bridge this uh, huge scale difference of seeing the world as boundaries. I'm signing up for a course in the Media Lab next semester of the of Learning Technology. With Mitch Resnick. Yeah. That's, that's I hope to tie it in. If I could just add on a little bit to that. Yeah. Um, for example, I think you were talking about um, a couple of things in relation to um, drawing and self-analysis, and then your uh, area of interest and expertise in numerology, and then you made a connection to the massive online courses. And I think a reflection on, for example, what would be what what would be lost and what would be gained if some of these mass online courses took place. I think that might be, is that in relation to what you were talking about, Jan? Kind of making these connections between something that you're looking at under a microscope to this macro vision, right? Not, 
for answering now, but for exploration next year. This is kind of a, it's an inch power of 10, you know, because you, you've got these big patterns and you've got these small patterns, but you're not kidding. Okay? Like, for example, there's this world of service design, but yet your uh, perfect customer is a very, very limited system. It's a very limited pattern. It doesn't really get that far out in the world and make, and make change and make difference. Um, I think that's a great, like, tangible example of what Jan's talking about and what is talking about. This connection between, I see patterns here, I see patterns here, I see patterns here. The real strength is being able to connect them together and flow in and out of them because that's where we can start to say, here's where a small piece of design connects to a wider concept, it connects to a wider concept so that that small piece of design can really make fundamental change. That's where the really interesting stuff starts to happen. So. Uh, so what I wanted to say is that I think you're very privileged because you see these patterns. And looking at your presentation, you make some connections, some jumps from content that I cannot follow very well, which means that I don't see these patterns as well as you do. And connected to what some of the people have said, I think that one of things that you should focus on is making these patterns appear to others. Because, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of value in understanding these things. But if I see the patterns, I'll believe you more. Uh, like, if I, I might not believe in numerology, but if you show me enough patterns, maybe I'll do it. Uh, yeah, so I focus on that. The, um, we had a great example a few years ago of um, Joe Liberty. And Joe was dealing specifically with a certain type of uh, learning disability. He was very interested in building research tools for a particular learning disability. And it was funny because he spent about maybe a, not quite a half of his thesis sort of doing projects. And, and then he finally sat down and did what Paul was trying to do and, and, and say, I want to explain to you what it's like to have this. And at that point, our understanding of his project fundamentally changed because we didn't understand it to depth we needed to understand it to analyze it. So what Paul's talking about is, I think, a really great point, which is, you know, you need to bring us to a place to understand, to put us in that context of being able to understand the work. This is the, this is the role of the thesis document within thesis, right? That's what all of our thesis students are trying to do with the contextual history and all of this stuff. The same thing I think you get a lot of benefit out of, because then we can better understand the types of things you're trying to teach. A really nice presentation today, it seems like you covered so much territory and you covered it very, very clearly. It's great. And I just want to say, like, I mean, this is a great crit that you're getting today, a lot of great feedback. And you're in such a nice position to be able to say what it is you want to do here. And I just hope that you put that at the core of all your thinking from here on out. And I can't help but, I know maybe you came to it after the perfect human process project, but if you had had that idea at the beginning, I think we would have seen a very different project. And it's just a great place for you to be. Like, really root yourself with that idea, that philosophy, and build all your concepts around it, I think. You're going to have great work to show. Okay, thank you. Thank you.